Hey everyone, this is Steve Bishop from ProgrammingMadeEasy.com and today I thought I'd bring to you guys another In My Opinion video where I'm actually going to be doing a bit of a follow-up to my last video. Uh, and my last video was on access and the future of access. Well, this isn't really the future of access so much, but it is kind of a follow-up to that. Um, because it is addressing a couple of things that were brought to my attention in the comment section below that video. So first, I want to start off by talking about Pokemon Go, okay? That's kind of a, maybe a different direction to go here, but um, let me talk about Pokemon Go for just a second. Some of you guys know what Pokemon Go is. You may have even played it, um, but they've had some real struggles re recently to keep their player base. And I think it's more than just because it's a coming and going fad. Um, so for those of you guys who don't know what Pokemon Go is, it's a fun little application you can get for your phone. And you just go out and you, you know, wander around and you hit Pokestops and you collect items. You try to catch Pokemon out in the wild. And then are, there's things called gyms that you try to take over. Well, uh, my wife and I, we were very avid players of Pokemon Go for quite some time. Uh, we were not early, early adopters, but we started playing it fairly early on in its life cycle. And um, for the most part, when Pokemon Go was released by Niantic, who is the developer of Pokemon Go, there were some initial struggles. There were some problems with the servers having some locking issues and you couldn't log in all the time and the game would freeze and do various things that were very, um, very, un they, were, they didn't make people very happy. Now, a lot of us overlooked that because we thought, well, it's just struggling, uh, you know, give them some time to iron out some of the kinks, but we figure that it'll probably come back and they, they did fix some of those issues when it came to logging in and you know some of the lockup issues. However, there were still some very glaring bugs. Um, for example, the the whole reason at very beginning there was this part of it called a tracker. And the tracking mechanism allowed you to kind of deduce where which direction you should go to try to go find a particular Pokemon. But that feature was actually the cause for all of the servers to be so slow and, and to freeze and lock up the application and not log you in. So Niantic decided to take that feature out of the application to solve the problem. And that was all fine and under, you know, we all understood, okay, that was probably the cause and uh, you know, getting rid of this functionality was going to allow for the rest of the application to work, okay. But we were all wondering, you know, running under the assumption that Pokemon would have this type of functionality back introduced into it at some other point, maybe not exactly the way that it was set up, but some sort of functionality that allowed you to track Pokemon and go try to find very specific ones that you were hunting for. Um, but we never got that. We never got a replacement. And in fact, the closest we ever got was a third party tool, um, something like Pokevision. And Pokevision was a website that was actually able to show you on a map exactly the pre precise location of where Pokemon were in your area. So you could, you know, resize the, the map to see exactly what was out there. And this was, of course, a form of cheating. But understand that half of the user base, half the, the, the players were using Pokevision. That's right, half. So half of their player base was using this third-party tool that allowed them to cheat. But mostly that was even necessary because Pokemon Go had gotten rid of this tracker option. So you have Pokemon Go, you have Niantic, um, seeing this third party utility, Pokevision, and instead of working together with Pokevision to come up with some sort of tracking system that both parties could accept, instead they gave a cease and desist to Pokevision and basically telling them to shut down. Uh, and not only that, but Niantic made it very well known that if you use any third-party tools or third-party utilities, that you will have your account banned. So basically, Niantic was telling half of their user base that they couldn't do anything that they wanted to anymore. They, they got rid of the functionality that the users liked, uh, and when the users went to go look for it, well, now you're going to get banned if you continue to use applications that do that sort of thing. So is that really the best business practice? Can you, can you think of any 
type of business that would that would keep its head above water if it told half its player base that their account was about to be banned if they continue to do these things. That's really not the best route to go. So this is just one example of how Niantic has really turned a blind eye to what the users have requested, type of features that the users want in their application. They got rid of that useful feature, and when someone else came along and replaced that feature with something else that was like it, they asked for a cease and desist and then threatened to ban everybody who tried to use such tools. So I think that's probably not the direction you guys should be going with your software development. Try to learn from that experience. And I'm going to give you another example of how Pokemon Go, and this was actually the, the reason why I left the game and I no longer play it. Um, for a very long time, Pokemon Go has allowed you to capture these gems. And the way you do that is other players will have their Pokemon residing in a gym, and you battle your Pokemon against their Pokemon until you, you know, win enough battles that it decreases that gym to a level that you can put your own Pokemon in and you can capture the gym. So since the beginning of the game, there's been a little problem. If you go and take down a gym and now you know you've you've leveled it down all the way to zero so that it's not owned by anyone at at all and then you go to try to drop your pokemon in well there's a very good chance that someone else has wandered by and dropped their pokemon in before you you have even had a chance to drop yours in because you will still be stuck at the screen telling you that you have won and that you've you know, knock the gym down, and you're sitting there for about 10 full seconds before you actually have the ability to take one of your Pokemon and put it in the gym. And in that 10 seconds, anybody who's wandering by or passing by could just drop their own Pokemon in there. And this is a very simple bug that they could very easily fix. And they even knew about this bug. They knew about it very early on in the game's life cycle. They said that they would, that they knew it was there, but they haven't done anything to fix it. So they have a bug that allows for people, and you can imagine if, if it takes me 30 minutes to take down a gym, and then after the end of 30 minutes of working really hard to get this gym all the way down to zero, I can't even take it over because someone else just wanders by and drops their own in. That's pretty aggravating. That really kind of pisses you off. And that's happening all over the place. That's happening to millions of players every day. So... What did Niantic do about this? Well, nothing. They, they've, they said that they know it's, it's an issue. They knew about it way back when they first released the application. They knew that they had this problem, but they haven't done anything to fix it. So because of the lack of response of Niantic to feature requests and changes that are really necessary to make the game even really playable at this point, uh, and instead they focus more on things that they want to do, things that they want to create, you know, like a different type of menu system that they like more than what was already in place. And yes, it may be nice, but this is not a glaring problem, having a, a better menu system. That's, that's not going to, you know, somehow change the way that we view the game. It's just going to help with certain things. So when you think about the type of requests that you get, from your customers or for your, from your user base, make sure you're addressing those features. And if you can't do them, make sure you explain fully why you can't do them. Communicate with them. Let them understand what it is that you can and cannot do. Now, why do I bring this up? Well, it's interesting because on the last video, when I was talking about access and the future of access, one of the things that I mentioned was ADP and how it was a great useful feature that Microsoft just took out for no particular reason. And they didn't give a reason. They didn't tell us why they did it. Well, um, I also have some criticisms for Microsoft not necessarily responding in a timely manner to the features that we want, namely the .NET, uh, you know, being able to incorporate .NET classes and .NET applications with it or vice versa, you know, being able to incorporate access into the .NET applications. So um, I'm just going to switch over to my screen here so that you guys can see. And I have this uh, response from Justin L. from my last video, and he mentions this fast track website from Microsoft, which 
tells you uh, what the developers at Microsoft are currently working on for access, as well as this uservoice.com. And this uservoice.com allows you to actually give feedback or request features from the access team. So um, let's just take a look here real quick at what type of suggestions are being requested. Incorporate Power BI as an add-in to new version of Access 2017. And we can see that Microsoft team has said, yes, okay, this is under review. That's because it's the top idea. It's got 274 votes. And here, look at the second one, the second item, improve access programmability. There are many new technologies available that Access cannot take full advantage of because it's either in .NET or requires JavaScript. So there's this thing about, you know, Access staying behind the calm world, and we need to branch out into the .NET framework so that we can provide more functionality. And again, this is under review. And for to, to give the Access team credit, they've got some of these things that they are currently working on and planning to, to do that have been upvoted by the user. So this is a fantastic way for users to go and make requested feature changes and for the access team to respond to that and tell you what's going on. And I found it very interesting that if I go to the statuses and go to done, you'll notice if I go to down a little bit here, 713 votes for bring back the support for connecting to dbase so that this was uh something that was taken out you could previously connect to dbase but now uh for a while there you couldn't and really again this begs the question why would you take out a functionality why would you take something out but uh they they have reinstated it and we can look here on the microsoft fast track and we can see in the in development section there's dbase file support. So connect an external dbase database and import a link, import or link to dbase files. So Microsoft is now definitely doing much better at responding to what the users want for access. And this is a good tool, this type of feedback and giving a response and some sort of tag to tell everybody exactly what stage it's at uh, is really a fantastic thing. And I'm glad to see Microsoft doing this um, and of course, there's some trolls that come on here and make stupid comments and things like that. But for the most part, it looks like, um, you know, Microsoft is trying to respond to the requests of the user. And this is great. This is a little bit of a direction, a different direction than what Microsoft has been known to be doing uh, in their past. They, they typically don't have this kind of feedback and response to what the features are that are requested. But I think this kind of gives a bit more of a formal outlet for us as users uh, to give them our feedback about what we think should be implemented, and then for us to also vote up those ideas that we like. So this is good. Now, I also want to take one other comparison here. Um, if we go to Google and you think for a second, why did Google get so big? And I'm just going to open up the Google.com simple enough to type out so the domain is very easy and simple but just take a look at this screen for a second and i think you'll realize that it is delivering a feature and only that feature it's not doing anything more it's not doing anything less it's doing precisely what you want it to do if i go to google and i want to search for something i know it's not going to take me a bunch i'm not going to see a whole big screen full of flashy things and a bunch of other things they want me to look at all I'm given is this simple little search button, uh, this search uh, text box, and I can click on the button to go search. And then if I can, want, you know, I can click on the I'm feeling hungry or I'm feeling lucky or whatever button to get the first response. So they made it so that this is a very simple interface that gives you exactly the feature you want. No more, no less. And this is very important to remember. You don't want to just necessarily deliver a feature and then go off and create your own extra set of special things that you think the user might want. Okay, this is a very common problem that I know a lot of developers get into. And I have the habit of doing this too, of where I think, oh, you know what? This would be great if I added this and I added that. And sometimes you have to just remember the Yagni principle. You ain't gonna need it. Okay, you're just not always going to need these things. 
So don't try to over deliver on things. If you have a feature request, deliver exactly that feature. That's why Google is so popular and how it gained the major lion's share of the market. And you want to see a comparison, let's go to, uh, to Yahoo, yahoo.com. And if we take a look at yahoo.com, this is a very different experience. We have a whole bunch of menus over here to the left. We've got banners that are in some sort of uh, HTML5 or Flash or something. And then we've got all these articles that we want to read. Oh, look, there's the weather. I mean, this is all much more complicated. Oh, I got mail. Oh, install the Firefox and Tumblr and Flickr. I mean, this is really, really busy. This is delivering so many other features than what I really want. Whereas if I go to Google, there it is. I want to do a search. This is where I'm going to go. Not because it's going to give me sometimes, you know, sometimes it's going to give me better results, but that's not really the main reason why I go to Google. It's because it provides a very simple interface. Let's try Bing. Does Bing deliver exactly what you want? It's closer than Yahoo, right? We have just this bar and a search with a couple of things off to the side. So I'd say that they're moving definitely in the right direction. They've got these tiles down here, which, okay, that's that's okay, but it still seems kind of busy. The pictures in the background, I don't know, different, different screens are going to render this at different rates. It's not always simple. It looks kind of busy just because it has this picture in the background. And it's got my login information and all these other sections of the page I can go to. Whereas if you look at the Google one, if I want to go somewhere else, I really only have this here that I can click on, and that'll bring down all my other options. This is a very simple interface that at first appearance only delivers what I want. If I want something else, I can go look for it in a very simple, identifiable manner. I go click on that button, and I get all the other places that I can go in Google. This is a much simpler way to do things and a, and a very simple interface and feature that makes searching very simple. And even when I do, you know, do a search for something, my results are pretty straightforward. It gives me exactly what I'm looking for. It gives me something because something matches a song. So it gives me a YouTube example of it and even tells me a little bit about that song. Because that Google figures that's probably the most likely thing that I was looking for. But if not, then it gives me these very simple little bite-sized pieces of information about what each one of these are. A title, a link, and a little description. Very, very simple, nothing complicated. Now let's go back here to Bing. Let's type something. Okay, this isn't too bad. It gives me a dictionary definition. That could be very useful. And it gives me images, videos, maps, news, explore. I think this is why Bing is not that bad of an alternative. And I don't mind using Bing instead of Google. It's really not that bad. I'd say the one improvement that they could probably do is just, I don't know that these background images are all that necessary. Yes, they make it look pretty, they make it look nice, and it's kind of cool to see all the different pictures, but that isn't why I'm here. I'm not here to get a picture. I'm not here to look at a screen with beautiful forestry. I'm here to do a search, deliver the feature that I want, nothing else, Nothing special, nothing extra, just what I want. And so consistently, time after time, I find myself going to Google because this is all I have to do. That's all I want to do. So that's Google. Let's do one other let's let's do one other example of how Google provides this. Let's go to Google Maps. Okay, so here's Google Maps. Pretty simple gives me the general area of about where I'm located. Okay, that's not really my location, but close enough, gives me a nice little map. And I can do a search for somewhere around here. There's a Ace Hardware somewhere around here. It will tell me where all the Ace Hardwares are. That's pretty cool. Very simple little interface. Now let's try something else. Let's go to the competitor that existed. And most of you guys, if you're old enough, you can remember MapQuest. MapQuest was here before Google Maps. And let's compare. It thinks I'm at that location. And I can zoom out and I can zoom in, but look at all these busy little 
buttons that I've got everywhere. I've got to find places to get directions. I've got advertising. I've got a login and a sign up. It just looks pretty busy. I mean, compare that again to just Google Maps. Just pull this open. I mean, look at how simple this is. It's not busy at all. And again, if I want to get to those extra special things, I can just click on this little button right here and that'll give me the access to the other parts of Google. So this is delivering precisely what I'm looking for. Nothing more, nothing less. Show me the mapped area. And if I want directions to someplace, all I have to do is go search for it and I can go get directions to it, right? I just have to pick where I want to go. And there's my directions, right? That's how I can do it. So that's very simple, but MapQuest, okay, I want to get directions. How do I get directions? Well, where, do I, where am I starting? Well, don't you already know where I'm starting? Where are you going? Uh, recent events, current location, uh, let's try Ace Hardware. Okay, this seems a little harder for me to find what I'm looking for, doesn't it? Okay, there's one there. Add to route. Okay, um, is that necessary? I Don't I want to go to that route? How can I get the, oh wait, where's my directions at? See, it's just getting more and more complicated. It's not that I can't figure it out. It's just that this is simple. This is easy. There's nothing more, there's nothing less than what I want. The feature is being delivered precisely the way and manner in which I want it. So the whole point of this, the whole point of this discussion is to talk to you guys about when you start to do your development and you've been given a request by a client or a user of your application, make sure that you understand exactly what they want and deliver nothing more and nothing less than what they want. Even though there are going to be things in the background you're going to have to do in order to make some of those things happen. And yes, there are improvements that are going to be maintenance type of things that you need to be able to add to the application to make it better. But typically those things need to have some sort of feature enhancement that was requested. And you want to make sure it does not appear like a gross exaggeration or unnecessary work of what it needs and what you need to do in order to deliver that feature. Because think about it, from a client perspective, if I'm paying you hourly to do a particular job, and here I see on the in, in the invoice that you did a whole bunch of other things other than what I asked you to do, well, that's probably going to rub me the wrong way because I didn't ask you to do all those things. Why did you add all these extra special features? Do only what you have been requested to do. And don't under-deliver. Don't say, I'm sorry, you know, you, you've got to... If you make a promise, if you make a commitment, you've got to meet that commitment. You've got to be able to make that feature happen. So be very cognizant of what you can deliver. You know, there's going to be some exploratory phase. So that's why I typically do, I do things in iterations. I don't try to deliver the whole enchilada. I don't try to take on a project and do its entirety, right? I don't want to take this big, long project with, you know, a, a thousand feature requests and then say that I'm going to deliver it in the next year. That's a silly way to try to do business. How do I know that I'm going to deliver on July 5th, 2018? How do I know that that's precisely the date that I'm going to make the delivery? It's better to do things in an iteration and to pick just the bare minimum of what it's going to take in order to deliver precisely what has been asked of you. And then incrementally, continue on and pursue and add more features to the system. It's in doing it this way that you realize there's a lot of stuff that you think you might need to add that you don't. There's that YAGNI principle, you ain't gonna need it, okay? It's going to give you much better response times to your clients because, or your, your whoever your user base is because they're gonna make a feature request and you're not gonna be so buried in some other past work that you can't deliver in a timely manner. So they're gonna get faster response. They're going to have faster features delivered to them. They're going to have a, a much smaller time frame that they think that they're going to get the delivery. Do I want to wait a year to a year and a half to finally get the whole big application that my company needs? Or would it be better for me to get a small little application that does at least a part of what I need it to do and then build from there and add more features to it that I know I'm going to need? Because maybe my my requirements, my business requirements change, 
you know, they change all the time. Maybe over the course of a year, I thought I would need a feature and it turns out I don't need it. Why would I, you know, if, if I've already got a development team going in that direction to build that process, uh, I may feel intimidated as a cluster, as a customer or as a client to tell them to back off of that. I already signed an agreement that said that I need this feature and they're going to go develop it for me. So it's just all around a much better process to work small, do a small little iterations and build new features, add new features, one or two, maybe three at a time. Don't, don't try to, you know, fill up your entire year with a project. You need to do small little tiny bits of iterations and deliver exactly the features that are requested of you. No more, no less. Don't do any more than you have to and make sure that you deliver exactly what you promise you're going to deliver each time. That's the only way that your clients or your users are going to develop trust in you. So just listen to your clients, listen to your customers, hear what type of features they want and deliver those features, not what you think that they want. Don't try to just you know, create things in your own mind because you're the developer and you're all knowing and all seeing. Listen to your clients, let them tell you what they want and don't do anything more than delivering exactly what they've asked for. So I hope that this uh, kind of talks a little bit about some of the things that were asked in the comment section of my previous video. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, please don't forget to like, favorite, and subscribe to my channel. And as always, if you have a question that you would like me to answer in one of these In My Opinion videos, please drop me a comment in the comment section below this video, and I will probably answer it. Uh, especially if it's a good one. And uh, this one was a good one. I, I thought that it was important to follow up with this. So anyway, I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your day. And until then, I see, I, until the next video, I hope to see you guys there and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks. Bye-bye.